It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Vermont is now opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier has forced the Auditor General to essentially become a rubber stamp to allow clearly partisan government advertising to be approved. This is not acceptable. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing and restore the Auditor General's oversight of government advertising? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would just say to the uh, the member opposite that Ontario was the first and remains the only jurisdiction in the entire country that has legislation to prevent partisan advertising. Mr. Speaker, that is that is the reality. And while partisan advertising is now banned, um, it is still permissible and it will continue to be permissible and important for the government to inform the people of Ontario about initiatives that impact their lives. So let me give some examples of the kinds of things that people need to know about getting the flu shot, updates to the sex ed curriculum, consumer protection, sexual violence and harassment awareness, Order. organ donations, Mr. Speaker. And letting families know about our Fair Hydro Plan is important too, Mr. Speaker. There are aspects of the plan, the increases to the Ontario Energy Support Program that are application-based, Mr. Speaker. It's Answer. important that they go to the website and that they understand what's available to them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier says this government hasn't, hasn't taken away the AG's oversight. Who do we believe, this Liberal government, no. under multiple OPP investigations, or the Auditor General, who has clearly said that the powers have been stripped, that there's partisan ads running on the air right now as we speak? It, what fantasy world are they living in? They're running ads right now. They're abusing taxpayer dollars right now. They know it's wrong, Mr. Speaker, but this is a government that's had a history of abusing taxpayer dollars. So rather than pretend you have not stripped the Auditor General of that right to have oversight, will the Premier do the Order. right thing and stop running these partisan Liberal ads at the expense of taxpayer dollars? The Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And you know, government advertising plays an important role in informing Ontarians. And I think we all know that sexual violence has a devastating impact on the lives of victims and their families, and it's far too prevalent in our society. If you look at the Who Will You Help campaign, launched in March 2015, it challenged existing attitudes. And what were the results? Well, you, you caught yourself on an oops. I'm glad you did because the member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. And there's a couple of others that are on the edge. President. So the Who Will You Help campaign was viewed by over 7 million, generated more than 85 million views worldwide. But within the important thing is there were results. Within six months, 55 percent strongly agreed that they had an obligation to intervene when wet witnessing sexual Thank you. harassment. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, these are diversion tactics. They're mentioning ads that the Auditor General did not have problems with. What we're seeing right here is the Auditor General has pointed back that the government took away oversight and is now taking advantage of that by running ads that are clearly partisan. They should be paid for by the Liberal Party, but instead they're charging to taxpayers. I don't want diversion tactics. I don't want talking points. They stripped the powers from the Auditor General to abuse taxpayer dollars for self-interest vanity ads. I'm asking the government to do the right thing. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, rather than talking points, yes or no, will you restore the powers of oversight that you took away from the Auditor General? Here, here, here. You see the police? You see the police? Thank you. President. Leader. Hang on.
Come around, sir. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Perhaps the Leader of the Opposition can then explain why they did not do the right thing in 2004 and voted against the bill that introduced the most stringent limitations of partisan advertising in the province of, uh, in, the, in our province. Why did uh, Speaker, the member from Simcoe Gray, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, the member from York Simcoe, the member from Perry Sound Muskoka, the member from Haldimand Norfolk, the member from Oxford, the member from The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. The Minister of Labour, come to order. And the member from Dufferin Caledon. Finish, please. All these members I just named, Speaker, still serve in this legislature. Why they did not? You want to do that? I will too. The member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. As soon as I sit down, don't start up. Why did these PC members did not? did the right thing in 2004, Speaker, and, and voted for a bill that put an end to Mike Harris-style partisan advertising. Speaker, we all remember that Sir. advertisement of Mike Harris where he flicked the lights off on Ontario and closed hospitals and Thank closed you. schools, Speaker. Thank you. New question? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We have many great, phenomenal physicians here today with Ontario Medical Association, and I'm sure members across the aisle have been hearing from these physicians in communities across Ontario. I know I heard about the Canadian Institute for Health Information's annual report. The report revealed patients are waiting longer for cataract surgery. Last year, only 70 per cent of patients had their surgery within medically accepted Time frames. This was down from 86% in 2012. The facts speak for themselves. Patient care is being diminished. Mr. Speaker, cataract wait times are getting worse, not better. How much longer is this government going to fail patients? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me. Um, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to uh, to speak to this as well, but I, I just want to I just want to welcome the uh, the OMA and the members to uh, to Queens Park today, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the doctors, obviously, doctors are an essential part of the uh, the healthcare system, Mr. Speaker. They're essential to the delivery of a of a strong and sustainable uh, healthcare system. We're working to deliver on our mandate in healthcare, Mr. Speaker, to improve access, reduce wait times, improve the overall patient experience, and we want to do that in partnership with all of our healthcare providers. We want to do that in partnership with doctors, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to work to continue to, uh, to improve that partnership. I look forward to having an opportunity to, uh, to meet with some of the, the membership today, and I know that members across the House will be Answer. having those meetings. And thank you very much to the OMA for being here. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, it's a bit rich hearing from sure the government is. here today in the sure House is. when they vilify and disparage our physicians across the province. It's not right. Physicians right devote devote passionately, uh, dedicated uh, in, in their work life to care for patients. And the reality is we have 29,000 doctors who go to work and put patients first, and this government is not putting patients first. Right. You know, I didn't get an answer about cataracts. Maybe I will in the in, in this second response. But what I want to know is what is this government going to do about the chronic underfunding of health care? Everywhere I go in Ontario, I hear about hospitals that are struggling to make ends meet. I hear about physicians. You are really not helping yourself. Mr. Speaker, whether it's hospitals that are underfunded, whether it's nursing cuts, or whether it's physicians who have who, who are seen education. the biggest diminishment of morale because of this government's cuts, it's not right. And what I'm asking of the government is, can I get an answer on cataract times? Can I get an answer on the underfunding? Question. And is there even one physician in this province that actually supports this government? No. Their record in health care is embarrassing, Mr. Speaker. Okay. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, I am, uh, I am going to take this opportunity to do a shout out to my dad. He's 91 years old, Mr. Speaker. He started practicing medicine.
happened in Richmond Hill in 1952, Mr. Speaker. He practiced with three other doctors. He was on call every other weekend. He did uh, when York Central Hospital was built, which wasn't until I was uh, in my teens, Mr. Speaker. Until then, he had his uh, rounds at what is now South Lake, but was York County, Mr. Speaker. And we'd go up with him while he did his rounds, and we'd wait out on on the lawn. Many Thanksgiving dinners, many Christmas dinners were interrupted by kids being born, Mr. Speaker, that he would go and deliver because, of course, he was practicing during the baby boom. Mr. Speaker, I know exactly how hard doctors work. I know exactly how committed they are to the system, Mr. Speaker, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that we work in partnership with the docs in this province. Thank you. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, unfortunately those, roads, those words are hollow when you have a Minister of Health who disparages sure. and vilifies physicians across the province. Sure. Those words ring hollow when you introduce health legislation routinely in the House and don't consult them. Yes. The member from Beaches, East York. Please finish. This government introduces health legislation and doesn't include doctors. They're not at the table. They have no voice. It's not right. For three years, they've been working without a contract. You know, it's not a big secret that we have a pretty ugly relationship right now between the province's physicians and the government. We have 29,000 hardworking doctors, and they deserve some respect. They deserve a voice. And what I'm asking the Premier to, to actually answer, if you're not going to answer my question on, on, on cataracts, can you at least tell us, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier at least tell us when physicians will actually be at the table? Question. Again? Thank you. Premier. Serve health and long-term care. Serve health and long-term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to welcome Ontario's doctors, including medical students who are here today uh, for many meetings with, and I encourage all of uh, my colleagues on all sides of the House to take those meetings and, uh, um, and, and listen to what the doctors have to say. But, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, the, the Premier, a number of weeks ago, indicated that we were committed to binding in interest arbitration, that we were committed to making that the first uh, item to be discussed when we sit down uh, with our doctors. And I'm pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that last night those negotiations did begin with the first order of business to negotiate a process and an agreement for binding in interest arbitration with Ontario's doctors so we can move forward to other aspects of hopefully a, an agreement with their physicians in the weeks and months ahead, Mr. Speaker. No question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier, Speaker. The cost of electricity has gone up over 300 per cent under the Liberal government, uh, including 50 per cent just since this Premier took office. Families, businesses, municipalities and public institutions like schools and hospitals are suffering under the crushing weight of their hydro bills. Yesterday it was revealed that the new CEO of Hydro One took home $4.5 million dollars in 2016. Does the Premier think there's anything at all wrong with this picture, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I'm very concerned uh, and have been for some time, starting in 2013, Mr. Speaker, we were working to take costs out of the electricity system in order to reduce people's electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that more needs to be done. That's why our Fair Hydro Plan is going to take 25 per cent off people's yeah. bills come summer, Mr. Speaker. And for people who who uh, live in remote and rural communities, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. The member from Renfrew. And, Mr. Speaker, we're going to hold those uh, those increases uh, for at least four years, Mr. Speaker. We understand we understand that uh, the the improvements that have been made to the system had a cost associated with them, Mr. Speaker, and that's why the Fair Hydro Plan is in place. That's why people will see Answer. reductions come summer, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, four point five million dollars for the new CEO of the privatized Hydro One, which is 10 times more than the average of other Hydro CEOs in Canada. If the Premier plans to poll Ontarians to see what they think of this $4.5 million CEO salary, she should save her money, because yeah. I can tell her straight up, people are outraged and they are insulted by yeah. this salary. Absolutely. Well, 
privatization of Hydro One and put an end to this outrageous situation. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pleased to rise and uh, talk about this subject, Mr. Speaker, because I do know that the salaries are high and much higher than those of the vast majority of Ontarians. And I know, Mr. Speaker, many Ontarians are struggling to pay with their uh, to pay their electricity bill, and that's why we brought forward the 25% reduction um, for businesses, small businesses, farms, and families, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, they've transitioned into a a, a, a very good company, Mr. Speaker, a public publicly traded government company and not a government agency Mr. Speaker and let's look at what they've done over the last little bit, Mr. Speaker. They've made $60 million in productivity savings. They've improved their health and safety performance to the best on record, Mr. Speaker. They've advanced multiple initiatives for customers aimed at reducing their electricity rates, Mr. Speaker. And they took the initiative as well, Mr. Speaker, of reconnecting all of their yes, disconnected sir. customers back in December, Mr. Speaker. Now, I know the majority of the executive compensation is contingent on meeting more further targets. You are finished, but I was standing to get attention. Thank you. Final supplement. Speaker, it's unfortunate that all of the benefits are going to the top executives and the shareholders of the corporation instead of the people of Ontario. But at the same time as the Premier is defending this $4.5 million CEO salary, her Minister of Energy seems completely comfortable with the idea that mandatory use pricing is no big deal. Talk about being out of touch, Speaker. $4.5 million for a CEO while this Premier is punishing parents for cooking their dinner at dinner time right. and seniors for staying home during the day. Right. Does the Premier think this is the right thing for the people of Ontario, right. Speaker? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we're pleased to act and help those families, Mr. Speaker, with a plan that's actually going to reduce their bills by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. Not a plan that is pie in the sky, Mr. Speaker. Not a plan that's going to wait decades and decades before they'll even think about talking about helping low-income individuals, Mr. Speaker. We have acted. We have acted because we've listened to the people of Ontario and brought forward a plan that will reduce their bills by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's significant. When it comes to time of use, Mr. Speaker, again, it shows that they have no idea on the system, Mr. Speaker. We are making significant savings, a 5 percent savings on conservation, Mr. Speaker, which then takes more costs out of the system because we don't have to build Answer. more generation. It just shows that they're pie in the sky when it comes to electricity, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Here, my next question is for the Premier, but talk about pie in the sky. They didn't come anywhere near reaching the targets that they set in terms of taking right. energy off of peak use and conservation. So let's not pretend what the facts are around here. Look, the Premier told Ontarians repeatedly that the government would be able to maintain control over Hydro One even when the sell-off was complete. If that's the case and the Premier does have control over Hydro One, why hasn't she done anything about the outrageous salary that the CEO is currently collecting? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are a shareholder in Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, and that is something that is very clear. And when it comes to, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, the importance of recognizing that, yes, these salaries are high, and yes, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that they are much higher than the vast majority of Ontarians. And we also know that Ontarians are struggling to pay, many Ontarians are struggling to pay their electricity bill. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we brought forward our plan, the Fair Hydro Plan is the single largest electricity bill reduction in our province's history, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that low-income individuals will actually have their bills reduced by 25 percent, plus, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Electricity Support Program, which will help them even more. Low-income individuals Answer. were not even mentioned in the NDP idea, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure we're helping every family in this province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Somehow, somehow people are supposed to be happy that the Liberals have increased their bills by 275 percent, Speaker. I don't think they're happy about that. Look, if the Premier is unable, 
unable to rein in the CEO's salary, even when she says the government maintains control at Hydro One. Can she explain to Ontarians why she has spent years trying to sell the clearly false idea that even when the Hydro One sell-off is complete, the government will maintain control of it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know once again we've talked often about the sale of Hydro One and the benefits that we're going to be doing in investments and in infrastructure, Mr. Member Speaker. For but the one thing that you know the, the 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 third party doesn't talk about, Mr. Speaker, is is our government acting to eliminate coal. We now, Mr. Speaker, do not have coal. Um, part of our electricity system. And this morning, Mr. Speaker, we heard from kids, we heard from children that live in our province that now can actually go outside and play because we no longer have smog days, Mr. Speaker. Because of the investments that we've made as a government, we're actually benefiting families right across the province. And we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that that costs more. That that costs more, Mr. Speaker. $50 billion is what we invested to make sure that people can go outside and breathe. And while they wouldn't do that, Mr. Speaker, Answer. we did. And now we're making that as affordable as possible for people right across the province, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Premier is defending a ludicrous $4.5 million CEO salary. Right. She refuses to stop her wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One, even, now, even though it's now very, very clear that the government will have no control whatsoever of this new corporation. She and her minister clearly do not ex understand the struggles that families are facing with time-of-use pricing. When will this premier show Ontarians that she is actually serious about more than buying support for the next election in, face of sinking, in the face of sinking poll numbers, do what's right for the people of Ontario, not her political party, and stop the disastrous sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's under the leadership of this Premier, Mr. Speaker, that we are investing in infrastructure right across the province, Mr. Speaker. It's under the leadership of this Premier, Mr. Speaker, that we are reducing bills by 25 per cent on average, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we can continue to talk about the investments that we made, we spent $50 billion, Mr. Speaker, investing in a system that was left in tatters by both opposition parties, by freezing rates, cancelling ideas, not moving forward at all, Mr. Speaker. They kept kicking, the cur kicking to the curb the electricity system. We didn't do that, Mr. Speaker. We invested. We built a, cle a clean system, a reliable system, and now an affordable system. Thank you. Your question to Mr. Melvin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government has waged an ongoing battle with Ontario's doctors. Many times they've created the illusion that doctors' billings equal their take-home pay. Instead of working with doctors, time and again the Minister and this Premier have unilaterally cut patient services and attempted to blame the doctors for this government's own mismanagement. Speaker, with the OMA present here today, will the Premier stand up and apologize for her government's treatment of doctors in this province? Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, uh, encouraged, greatly encouraged, that a number of weeks ago uh, the OMA named a new negotiating team for themselves. Uh, shortly thereafter, the government uh, named its new negotiating team. Uh, the Premier and I expressed our commitment that the first order of business as part of negotiations of that first episode of sitting down at the table together, that episode that took place last night, Mr. Speaker, for the first time, that the first order of business would be to agree on a process for binding inter interest arbitration. We're confident with this uh, renewed spirit of collaboration, with the commitment that the Premier and I have made, uh, with the, uh, quite frankly, the talented and committed individuals uh, at the table. I think both uh, Ontarians and the membership of the OMA can be satisfied that we have the right people at the table, I believe, yes, to truly uh, work together uh, on this challenging but attainable task, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, 
Yeah. Where was this talk three years ago before they started the vilification of doctors? Why weren't they doing this three years ago? Mr. Speaker, recently it was revealed that the government created their negotiating strategy through polling and not what was in the best interest of patients. Everything they did through the media was calculated to sway the public's opinion against doctors. Instead of working with the OMA to find a solution to benefit patient care, this government spent money on polling and devised schemes to vilify the profession. Speaker, according to the Financial Accountability Officer, this government will need to cut an additional $2.8 billion from the health care system. Is this Premier going to base her decisions on current polling numbers or work with the frontline health care professionals to make the best decisions based on patient care? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, that question had so many parts to it. I think it's easiest. I'm going to go back to the initial question from the Leader of the Opposition where he referenced uh, wait times in this province, and he referenced the Kaihai report that, indeed, I know he cherry-picked from it. There is more work to be done, but hip replacements—85 percent of Ontarians are, have their hip replacements replacements completed within the medical benchmark, 6 percent higher than the national average. Knee replacements, 12 percent higher than the national average. 99 percent of radiation therapy within the medical benchmark. The lowest wait times for MRIs, CT scans, the shortest wait times from GP to specialist, from specialist to treatment. On average, Ontarians are receiving care more than four weeks earlier than the national average. We have some of, if not all of, the shortest wait times in this country, Mr. Speaker. Wait times for general surgery have gone down by 13 per cent, for medical oncology down Answer. by 39 per cent. We have done this, Mr. Speaker, because of our doctors, because of our nurses, because of all those health care practitioners who work so hard. You see that, please? You see that, please? New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, today OSSTF released findings from its study on violence in the workplace, findings that echo earlier and equally shocking results from ETFO. 41% of OSSTF members reported an increase in violent incidents in their schools over the last five years. None said that violence is decreasing. Yet in this context of rising violence, four out of five OSSTF members were either unaware of or unable to access violence reporting forms, and more than half said that they are often pressured not to report a violent incident. Speaker, after five years, the situation is worsening, not improving. What will it take for this government to show education workers that it is serious about protecting education worker health and safety? Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite, uh, who is uh, the critic for education, for this very important question. Um, Mr. Speaker, under no circumstances are, is violence acceptable in our schools. We want our schools to be safe and healthy places for students, for teachers, for education workers, and uh, and that's something that uh, that we want to make very very clear, um, Mr. Speaker. I've uh, I've met with the um, the membership of OSSTF, and I, I've been very very clear with them that I recognize that we have to take this very seriously. The concerns around reporting that uh, that the member opposite asks, uh, I am concerned about that. We want to ensure we create a culture in our schools that promotes safety yes, and. Uh, and that's what we're working towards and working together with OSSTF on that. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the numbers from OSSTF and ETFO are alarming and provide an urgent call to action, action that is needed across ministries, including education, labour, health and children and youth services. OSSTF reports that, at least, that in at least one classroom per board per day, a student is removed due to a violent out outburst. The mental health needs of both students and education workers are being ignored, putting young people and education workers at risk. Yet 25 school boards are receiving $8 million less funding in special education grants, and school staff with specialized mental health training, like psychologists and social workers, are being cut. Speaker, how does the Premier plan to make schools safer when she won't even provide the basic supports that students need to succeed? Mr. Speaker, um, 
We are working with all of our partners in education. We have a provincial health and safety working group that is strengthening the culture of training and access to information to staff on violence prevention, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for example, we have des designated one half of a PA day. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we have designated one half of a PA day for our elementary teachers this past year for health and safety training. We've also added new mandatory content on supporting students with special needs in the enhanced four-semester teacher education program. Mr. Speaker, here's what we're investing in special education. We've increased our investments by 70 percent, Mr. Speaker, to $2.7 billion. We have increased the number of education assistants by 6,300, Mr. Speaker, we know that Answer. there is more that we need to do on this issue, and that's why we're working together across all aspects of the sector, including with the Minister of Labour, to focus on this issue. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Our government realizes that students should be able to. Finish, please. Our government realizes that students should be able to access higher education based on their ability to learn, not their ability to pay. We know that making post-secondary education more affordable is part of our plan to grow the economy, create jobs and build an inclusive future for Ontario. We have heard about exciting changes to OSEP this past year to make OSEP more generous for all students across the province, and I've had the opportunity to share this news with many of the students in Davenport. Could the minister give this House an update on how the OSAP changes are progressing. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Davenport for this very important question. Uh, just this morning, the Premier, the Minister of Education, and I uh, were at uh, Bishop Morocco Thomas Merton Catholic Secondary School to launch the new OSAP application. Yeah. Starting this September, over 210,000 students in this province will have free tuition. Their grants will be greater than the cost of their tuition. <laughs> Speaker, that means one in three post-secondary students in Ontario will have free tuition, and many middle-income students will have more generous uh, student uh, assistance than they have ever had before. The changes we have made are truly transformational. Here's our new deal with students. You work hard, you get the marks, Answer. you get accepted to post-secondary, and we're going to make sure that money does not prevent you get from achieving it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development for her answer on the great news for all students across Ontario. Speaker, I've heard the Premier say many times that Ontario's advantage is our people. I know that this means ensuring that our people have the best possible opportunities to access education. However, I know for many aspiring students, including those from my riding of Davenport, and especially folks who are returning to school as adults, the cost of going back Back to school can be daunting, not to mention confusing. With all these grant improvements to OSAP, what are we doing to make sure people know how much help they can get? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I, I confess that I have been showing the OSAP calculator on Ontario.ca slash OSAP to anybody who will let me show them that. Speaker, what it demonstrates is that there's tremendous support available for students. It means changes for everyone, but especially mature students, Speaker. They're eligible for more grants than ever before. Let me give you an example. If you go to Ontario.ca slash OSAP, use the calculator. It will show that if you're a single parent, you've got three kids, you earn $60,000 a year, and you're going to college, you're eligible for grants totaling $16,000, Speaker, way more than tuition, and an additional $8,700 in loans if you want them, Speaker. So tuition is Answer. free. There's also support for your family. For these changes to have the, have the impact we need them to, everybody needs to be Thank sharing you. the news, including members' offices. Thank you.
Your question, the member from Chatham, Ken Essex. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Uh, people across southwestern Ontario were shocked when the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy commented on greenhouses moving from Ohio Ontario to Ohio, saying, and I quote, part of what caused them to move were the high levels of humidity. But greenhouse growers were actually astounded, Mr. Speaker, by his comment because our area has always been high in humidity. Humidity, that's not the deal breaker. The cost of energy is the deal breaker, said Jim Domena, president and CEO of Red Sun Farms. Speaker, to the minister, why is this Liberal government spewing hot air about real costs of greenhouse relocations and lost investment? The minister, of Energy. minister of Agriculture. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ken Essex for his question this morning. Uh, last Thursday, I had the great opportunity to be in the wonderful riding of Durham with my colleague, Mr. Anderson, to announce a $19 million support package for the greenhouse energy in the province of Ontario. Oh, now, Mr. Program. Speaker, that's, that's real support. Now, Mr. Speaker, that's not just words. I am very pleased to share this information with my fine colleague from Chatham, Ken Essex. Ontario's greenhouse sector is a major contributor to the provincial economy. We appreciate the government of Ontario's support and recognition of the need to invest in our future, as well to work with our members on challenges facing Ontario's greenhouse sector. This funding will support the continued growth of our sector, its capacity That's to create right. jobs, drive exports, provide a reliable supply of locally grown greenhouse products. Jan Grinderhorst, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Well, back to, back to the minister. I'm not sure which one. Support package is probably code for life support. De Niro Farms in Leamington used less, nat used less natural gas this past February than they did over the same period in 2016. The result? The bill more than doubled. Of course, there is no line item on natural gas bills showing the new cap and trade cost. Kind of makes me wonder if the government lobbied the OEB to bury the costs in the delivery charges. But thankfully, Mr. Speaker, Union Gas created an online tool which determined De Niro Farms paid over $15,000 in cap and trade costs, bringing their total monthly bill to just over $30,000. So, to the minister. Minister, Question. how can De Niro Farms and other greenhouses cope after this government more than doubled their natural gas bills? Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member for supplementary because I have some more quotes. Here's one from George Gavese, who is a friend of the member from Chatham, Ken Essex. We are extremely pleased with the announcement made by Minister Leal today. We are very optimistic with the prospects of continuing our work with the government of Ontario to determine how we can assure a vibrant and sustainable future for our province's greenhouse sector. Mr. Speaker, it's better than that. Today's announcement confirms the government of Ontario's understanding of the greenhouse sector's contribution to the economic success of the province Tory's through our investment, innovation, down. job creation, productivity, here, here. and world competitiveness. This funding announced by Minister Leal, our Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, will help keep our quality grown in Ontario products yes, as the first choice for North American consumers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. Member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. My Speaker. Health care in Ontario is at a tipping point. Families and seniors need the Premier to cut wait time and to stop overcrowding in our hospital. But instead of listening, this Premier has let us all down by doing tremendous damages to the relationship with the good doctors of Ontario 
Many of them are with us today. This morning, we've learned that the Premier actually spent money on, and get that speaker, not one, not two, ten polls to try to win her war with the doctors. Why does this Premier think it is right to spend public money on polling and on PR when every dollar should be going to good health care for the people of Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question, and uh, this, to be honest, I think the, the party opposite wants it kind of both ways. They, they constantly are asking us and reminding us to speak to Ontarians, to consult with them on the direction that our government is going and the, the policies we should implement, Mr. Speaker. Minister. And, Mr. Speaker, when the Ministry of Health consults with Ontarians across the province, in person, online, through letters, through polls, we do it in a variety of ways on a myriad of issues, Mr. Speaker, to help inform us, the government, yes, on the best ways we can put patients first in the province, they complain. This method of reaching out to Ontarians is important, and Thank I'm you. happy to talk more in the supplementary. supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. People want shorter wait times. They want faster appointment with their doctors. But instead of solving the overcro overcrowding in our hospital, the Premier froze funding for four straight years. Sure. Instead of working with the good doctors to improve care. The Premier made unilateral cuts to physicians' funding. Instead of cutting wait time, this Premier is watching the ER wait grow longer than they've been in a decade. And instead of putting every dollar into better frontline care, this Premier is spending money on polling, on PR, to help the Liberal Party. Why does the Premier think her job is to put the Liberal Party first and the needs of patients at the back of the line. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we continue to make substantial progress on wait times, and I have to counter the myths that the opposition member is perpetrating. A recent Fraser Institute report concluded that Ontario has the shortest wait times in the country, with median wait times more than four weeks lower than the national average. With ER, our wait times for the sickest patients have been cut by 29 per cent, while volumes have, in fact, increased by 40 per cent. ER waits for the least sick have been cut by 15 per cent. The Wait Time Alliance report card on wait time straight A's for Ontario, by the way, yes. notes that Ontario uh, continues to receive straight A's for wait times in five key service areas, hip replacement, knee replacement, cataract, cancer radiation, coronary artery bypass graft. Ontario, by the way, was the first to measure wait times in many important areas. We were certainly the first when it comes to either the PC party or the NDP party yes, that didn't bother to measure wait times at all, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank, you. Question? The member from Thank, you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for early years of child care. In my riding of Barrie, Show we are lucky to have a evidence. great early childhood Show educator program at Georgian College. But I have heard from many students that they are finding it hard to be motivated to pursue their passion of becoming an ECE. They're concerned about the low wages in the field and worry they may not be able to pay for their student loans or even for their own family's child care needs. Average salaries for ECE graduates have increased over the past five years to $31,000. However, they are still lower than the average salary of college graduates, which is $35,000 making recruitment and retention of ECEs difficult for child care operators. As a student and graduate, this is really discouraging. Can the minister responsible for early years in child care tell me and the, my constituents what is being done to ensure students pursue Thank their you. educational passions? Sir Status, the minister responsible for early years in child care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Barrie for this very important question. 
Speaker, we recently held public consultations across the province on childcare and heard from many early childhood educators about the challenges that they face when it comes to low wages. That's why. That's why we're investing in these professionals. So, our government is supporting a wage enhancement for eligible providers working in licensed childcare, and we're ensuring there's ongoing annual funding. So, for 2017, the ministry is allocating more than $188 million to support the wage enhancement and the home child care enhancement grant. That means eligible staff and home child care providers can receive a wage enhancement of up to $2 an hour plus 17.5 percent in benefits, and eligible home child care providers working with an agency could receive a grant of up to $20 a day. Mr. Speaker, these investments Thank are you. part of our plan. They're the right thing. Supplementary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. A wage enhancement is a step in the right direction. I'm glad to hear that our government is helping those who are ready to enter the workforce and who are passionate about their careers. It's important that we recognize the value of those who are shaping and caring for our youngest learners. And it's equally as important to make sure we retain the hardworking professionals who are already doing this crucial right. job. They are the front lines of our child's path through education. Can the minister tell me more about what she is doing to help encourage early childhood educators to stay in this field? Yeah, tell us, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer the member's question. Speaker, our government has committed to creating new license spaces for 100,000 more children over the next five years. Just think about that. This is not only an investment in our children's future, it's an investment in our economy and in Ontario families. Because with the addition of 100,000 new spaces, we will see an estimated 20,000 new ECE positions created in Ontario. That's 20,000 new jobs, Speaker. Through the wage enhancement and this new job creation, we can help create and close, I should say, the wage gap between registered early childhood educators working in kindergarten and child care professionals working in licensed child care settings. We will also stabilize licensed child care operators by helping them keep their ECEs and other child care program yes, staff, sir. and we will support more employment and income security. But, Speaker, this is about laying a foundation that will put our children on a path to success. Yes. Yes. Question, from here on Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On March 7, the Minister of Agriculture spoke about Canadian Agriculture Literacy Month and the importance of educating young people about opportunities in the agri-food sector. But there was a glaring omission. In 2015, I brought forward a motion. Growing Agri-Food Jobs, which passed with support from all parties, Speaker. It, re it recommended that the government add a component to the grades 9 and 10 careers and guidance curriculum on agri-food career opportunities. Sadly, Speaker, the minister failed to mention what progress has been made on implementing it when he gave a speech. We all remember when the Premier issued the Agri-Food Job Challenge. But due to inaction, the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council is now warning that we're, there will be a significant labour shortage by 2025. In light of the Canadian Question. Agricultural Literacy Month, will the Premier commit to seeing this important component of the curriculum implemented in time Thank for you. the next school year? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister of Agriculture, Food and thanks, Rural Affairs. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to appreciate the question from the honourable member this morning. And I know uh, uh, her longtime commitment in improving agricultural literacy uh, in uh, secondary uh, schools right across the province of Ontario. With regards to the, the Agri Food Challenge, uh, the Premier gave us a challenge uh, to create 120,000 new jobs in this sector uh, by the year 2020. I can report to you, Mr. Speaker, and all members of the House today, that we're well on our way to meeting that goal. We've created 42,000 jobs to date, Whoa. and so if you extrapolate that forward, we will meet we will meet that target uh, by the year 2020. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, every day as I'm traveling across the province of Ontario, when I'm in community colleges to see their graduates, when I'm at the University of Guelph to see their graduates, everybody's looking forward to careers in agriculture in the province of Ontario. Speaker, no one believes or trusts that minister. Back to the Premier. When I met with the President of the Treasury Board, she is sure—
Order. When I met with the President of the Treasury Board, she assured me my motion would be considered. Just last week, the Minister of Education proved that she can quickly jump to task when she announced the Financial Literacy Pilot Project. Speaker, why is the Premier, the Minister of Agriculture, the President of the Treasury Board, the Minister of Education and the entire Liberal Cabinet choosing to ignore the needs of Ontario's agri-food sector? There are two and a half days left in the Agriculture Literacy Month. So will the Premier, the former Minister of Agriculture, commit to adding agriculture to the guidance and career curriculum? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, the history from the uh, members of that side is really quite fascinating. What this government proposed, what this government proposed. The member from here on Bruce asked the question. I'm sure she wants to listen to the answer. Because I do. Mr. Speaker, when this government proposed a number of years ago to create a $100 million risk management program to support those farmers in the province of Ontario that were not covered by supply management, they voted against it. Oh, that was that terrible. Is, that's terrible. So, Let them down again. So every time we bring new innovations yes, to this House to trusted. continue to grow a sector, so a sector in this province that generates $36 billion to Ontario's GDP, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, they don't New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Skyrocketing hydro costs have made it more expensive to take the TTC. Last year, the TTC's hydro bill was up 13 per cent from the previous year, even though it used about the same amount of electricity. Since the current Premier assumed office four years ago, the TTC's hydro rates have gone up by over 40 per cent. The Premier said she wants to fix this quote-unquote mistake. But the TDC will not see the 25 per cent in hydro bill reductions that she's promising in ads. Ads, by the way, paid for with public dollars. Why did the Premier exclude the TTC from her hydro plan? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the honourable member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when it relates to Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, the first thing I think it's important for me to say about the TTC is that every rider on the TTC will be getting that 25 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, every single individual in Ontario's 444 municipalities will benefit from Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to the City of Toronto, which the TTC is part of, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see a two to 4 per cent reduction in their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. That's, that's a modest reduction, I know, Mr. Speaker. But there are also many other things that we do for municipalities, and we have uh, many uh, other programs that actually also help municipalities manage their energy costs, Mr. Speaker. For example, the Ontario Municipal Energy Plan Program provides funding to Answer. municipalities to help them plan for more efficient uh, energy usage. We also helped with $92 million from the Green Investment Fund, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. to help with other energy efficiency. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. Again, back to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker. I repeat, the TTC's hydro rates have increased by more than 40 per cent since the Premier assumed office four years ago. The Premier's hydro plan will make bankers rich, but it won't do anything to rein in the underlying costs of privatized hydro, which is making everything more expensive. The Premier's plan won't lower the TTC's hydro bills by 25 per cent or even even 17 per cent. Why is the Premier spending public dollars to promote a hydro scheme that makes bankers rich while allowing the TTC's hydro rates to keep rising out of control, driving up fares and making life more expensive for transit riders? Minister of Transportation. For transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for, a quest, uh, for her questions today. I uh, you know, and I can understand from the tail end of the second question that at the root of what she's asking about 
Uh, it relates, Speaker, of course, to making sure that transit in Toronto and transit right around the province of Ontario is not only there, but that it's accessible and it's affordable. Speaker, that member knows. I've had the opportunity to say this repeatedly in this House and elsewhere. There is no government in Ontario history that has done more to support public transit in the City of Toronto and in the other 98 communities across Ontario that have transit than this government under the leadership of our Premier Speaker. That member knows. Just a number of weeks ago, we announced that we'd be doubling the provincial gas tax program over the next four years, providing the City of Toronto alone with an estimated additional $170 million to a province-wide total Answer. of an additional $335 million annually Speaker, to all of the communities that have transit systems. Thank we'll you. keep building. We'll keep getting it right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Seniors Affairs. Minister, I want to again congratulate you on becoming Minister for Ontario's first ever Ministry of Seniors Affairs. This is an important step that affirms our commitment and leadership towards care for seniors. Minister, I know that you have been very busy in your new portfolio, and you have travelled all across the province, including visiting Christine McMillan and the Oasis Group in my riding of Kingston and the Islands. Yesterday, as part of Bill 87, the Seniors Act of Living Centre Act was introduced in the House. If passed, this Act will be a stronger, more flexible legislation than the current Elderly Persons Centre Act. This is great news for the over 260 existing Question. centers that provide services to over 100,000 seniors. These are important and timely changes, and I'm hoping that the minister can share more information. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for the important question. Speaker, our proposed Seniors Active Living Centres Act was developed in recognition of the changing nature of demographics in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, over the next 25 years, the seniors population in Ontario is projected to double to 4 million people. And it's important that people are able to age in our province in a way that allows them to be active, healthy, safe, and socially engaged. And elderly person centers play an important role in this. This act, Mr. Speaker, aims to modernize the framework for elderly person center so they reflect the realities of today's seniors better. One very symbolic change, Mr. Speaker, is that on yes, popular sir. demand, we are renaming the elderly person centers to seniors. Active Living Centre. Thank, thank, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister of Seniors Affairs for her answer. This sounds like great legislation that I'm sure that all members in this House will get behind. I have no doubt that the Seniors Association of Kingston Region in my riding will be pleased with the changes. With 675 dedicated volunteers, there's a spectacular number of dedicated community partners caring for our community seniors in Kingston and the Islands, and I'd like to extend my warmest thanks to their continued effort and passion. But, Minister, I would have to ask, how did you determine what changes you would want to make to the current legislation? The EPCs serve people of different backgrounds, of different levels of health, skills and education, of differing interests, and speaking different languages. They also have a That's large a question. of po program flexibility. Seeing how this program affects seniors across the province, from Wawa to Windsor, large city and rural communities, Thank you. how did you strike a balance? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, and I again want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for her great question. Her question was, how did we determine what changes to make to the Seniors Active Living Act? And Mr. Speaker, the answer is very simple. 
We went to the seniors of Ontario. Through surveys, consultations and stakeholder input, we were able to hear from almost 80 per cent of the elderly person centres, soon to be renamed Seniors Active Living Centres, and got a full picture on how to move forward with improving the program and the enabling legislation. Some of the proposed changes include empowering local communities, opening the program to potential future partnerships, and reducing the administrative burden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, uh, Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Speaker, today's Queen's, uh, today Queen's Park has been again been visited by disease sufferers who continue to wait for provincial approval of a life-altering treatment that's already been given the go-ahead by Health Canada. Speaker, sufferers of polycystic kidney, kidney disease, PKD, deal with the painful effects of tumors that can swallow impacted kidneys up to the size of a football. Last year, Health Canada approved the first ever PKD treatment, and yet Ontario has refused to cover this treatment under the public drug plan. Speaker, members of the PKD Foundation are meeting with the minister's office today, and some are here, of course, in the gallery. Will the minister tell these patients why he's not covering the treatment that they so desperately deserve. Thank you. Minister of Health, Lord, Lord, Lord. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question, and uh, um, I welcome those who are here today uh, to speak about uh, polycystic kidney disease, which is indeed, uh, unfortunately, a prevalent, uh, all too prevalent, but also uh, very challenging uh, condition for anyone to, to have. I think the member opposite should know by now, Mr. Speaker, that there's a process in place that uh, the Health Canada approval for a drug, generally for a specific indication, is only the first and one step in a multi-step process. Uh, at that time, once it's approved by Health Canada, there's a requirement that it be examined uh, for evidence of its effectiveness, its efficacy, and that historically used to be done separately by each province and territory. Now we've created a process, in fact, that was done nationally one time, and that's the process that we're applying here to review the evidence after Health Canada's approval to establish its efficacy. Supplementary. Yes, uh, Speaker, we understand well, that this well, treatment is there. not for every patient. However, PKD sufferers are here today with doctors who have outlined exactly those that would benefit and yet continued to wait for this important treatment. We've seen this story before. Rare disease sufferers continue to wait for action from the minister's so-called working group that he used to shoot down our call for a rare disease select committee. While our committee would have been completed its work by now, we still await word of the actual work from the minister's working group even though we hear the report is in fact sitting on your desk. Rare disease patients are tired of waiting and PKD patients need answers. Speaker, will the minister commit today to approve treatment for those PKD patients that will benefit from this important treatment and table the report his working group uh, has completed? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think I, is it Jin, I assume it's Jinark that uh, the member opposite is referring to. He's nodding his head. So it was re reviewed by that national process, the Common Drug Review. In fact, the Common Drug Review recommended that Jinark not be listed for the treatment of polycystic kidney disease because it was not shown to definitively improve relevant outcomes in patients wow. with that disease. Additionally, the Common Drug Review uh, noted a number of safety concerns associated with the drug, including liver injury, uh, low sodium, increases in uric acid and gout, polyuria, thirst and skin cancers. Uh, so it's important, Mr. Speaker, first of all, we take the politics out of this. We leave it to the clinical experts, the frontline doctors, the scientists, the academics to review the evidence. They've invited the manufacturer, in fact, to come forward if they have additional evidence. But in the spirit of collaboration and transparency, I've identified specifically why that ne negative recommendation to date has been. Answer. Thank you. We have a deferred vote. Uh, on the motion of second reading of Bill 111, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2017. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take their seats. On March 28, 2017, Ms. Sandals moved second reading of Bill 111. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mrs. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Naki. Mr. Naki. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Mrs. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Codney. Mr. Codney. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Ubisoft. Ms. Ubisoft. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sat. Ms. Sat. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gret. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 51, the nays are 42. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. Bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Order G111, third reading of Bill 111, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2017. Mrs. Sandals. President, Treasury Board. Speaker, I move third reading of Bill 111, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2000. Ms. Sandal moves third reading of Bill 111, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts of fiscal year ending March 31, 2007. It's a pleasure to house the motion carry. Yeah. I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 51. The nays are 42. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill. Troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.